Hello and welcome to the James Lab tutorial on immunoblot densitometry. I have a nice example of a two-color Lycor fluorescence immunoblot here um, that I'm going to use to demonstrate how to do very careful quantitative um, estimation of the abundance of proteins in different samples. What I'm, we're going to start off with is the set of raw files that come off the Lycor Odyssey instrument. First thing to emphasize is that all of the quantitative analysis should be on the raw 16-bit images that by default are saved as 700 and 800 .tif files by the Odyssey software. Any of these other logs or JPEGs are um, colored or processed displays of the raw information. So we want to make sure that we're always working with the 700 and the 800 TIFFs and then we keep track of what antibodies we're monitoring in the 700 or 800 fluorescence channels. I'm going to take these two images and open them in image J. We do all of our quantification in image J because it can appropriately handle the 16-bit images quantitatively without manipulating the numbers that go into the densitometry. So here's the 700 channel. Here is the 800 channel. We're going to start with the 700 channel and I should briefly explain what we're looking at before we get started. What I have here is first I'm going to uh, invert the image, which I know is shift I and then shift I here. So it looks more like an immunoblot. Uh, what we have are quadruplicated sets of seven samples um, for a viral infection of a cardiomyocyte cell line. This group of three, six, seven here is replicate one. This group here is time points one through seven of replicate two, time points one through seven of replicate three, and then time points one through seven of replicate four. Because I want to fuse these replicates ultimately in one quantitative file, note that I've scanned both of the membranes on the same scan, ensuring that they have the same fluorescence intensities, and we'll be doing all of the quantification in parallel with, with both of these. This is important because the way that ImageJ does the quantification, it's relative to the instance in which the quantification was done. Therefore, to the best of one's ability, you should be doing the quantification of everything that you're interested in in one scan. What are these bands? Uh, for this particular experiment, this lower band here, which coincides with this lower band here, is P38 MAP kinase that we're using as a loading control. This middle band here is tubulin, which we're also using as a loading control. And then these bands up here is the eukaryotic initiation factor, EIF4G. And we'll do that one last because that one's a little bit more complicated. We're going to start with the loading controls first. To begin, what we need to make sure is that before we do any densitometry, that the lanes are perfectly horizontal because as you see, we're going to be drawing boxes around lanes vertically. And so if the lanes are off on a diagonal, it's going to uh, make it harder for us to uh, quantify and identify the peaks of interest. The way that we rotate the image is image, uh, transform, rotate, and then it's generally helpful to keep the preview button on here. The default, for reasons that are unclear, are 15 degrees, and so it's, it's a clockwise rotation and I need to go counterclockwise, so I'll do that as negative one degree, which looks like it does a pretty good job for the left-hand image. So we'll click OK. Note, though, that this, the rotation that's good for this uh, blot here isn't necessarily the best one for this second one. I tried to line them up as best as I could, um, but I couldn't get them quite perfect. It is fair then to take a box, a rectangular box here, and run it over this lot and repeat the rotation. Transform, rotate, preview. So note now only this uh, 
side of the immunoblot is getting rotated. It looks like it needs another one degree counterclockwise rotation to be lined up perfectly. And we'll click OK. All right. Now let's start with the uh, tubulin. The uh, other thing I want to point out is that all I've done up to this point is invert the image. I can uh, scale it by click uh, here, adjust brightness and contrast, or this shortcut here, and make bands more or less intense. You'll see here that there's a cleavage product of EIF4G that occurs at later time points during the infection. Talk about that more in a moment. But what I want to emphasize here is that moving these sliders to provide you more contrast to see what you're interested in has no bearing on the quantifications, just for ease of visualization. Therefore, you can feel free to slide this as much as you want, such that you can identify your bands of interest. This is what, why it's important to do this in ImageJ, because that's not true necessarily in images uh, in software such as Photoshop. All right, next step is that uh, we need to draw the first lane here that we want to do the densitometry on. I'm going to do each one of these one at a time because I'm going to, uh, each band of interest one at a time because I want to be careful with the quantification here. So we'll draw a rectangle over the first time point of tubulin. You want to have it be uh, reasonably tight. And the other thing that I'm paying attention is that this box is vertically long enough so that we'll also be able to cover this tubulin band here, which is slightly offset vertically um, because I was working with two different membranes. I nudge this over, get it where it looks like it's pretty centered, and then I'll show the full menu option, but there are shortcuts for these. So we go to Analyze, Gels, Select First Lane. Strongly encourage you get used to the shortcuts. So Command 1, Command 2, which is to set up the next lane, and then Plot Lanes is the very uh, last se step. So we're going to say select first lane. And now this lane here is going to coincide with the first topmost um, trajectory, uh, uh, integrated density, when we analyze the lanes. Now from here, all I can do is just nudge over the box, which I'm doing with the cursor here, center the next lane, and do Command 2. And as I add more lanes, Command 2, Command 2, and on across both blots. The Lycor scan bed is large enough so that it is easy to do four blots or however many you want to scan concurrently, um, and in which case you'd just be moving this around to do the analysis. Note on lane 14 here, I didn't get everything into the box. That's OK. Um, it's going to be all relative to that box intensity across all of the other images. What I just tried to do is get the bulk of that sample in the density. Also note here, because the second blot has been uh, shifted vertically, I'm going to see an artifact of the lower band intensity when I do the analysis. That doesn't influence anything, it's just uh, something that I'll ignore, and you'll see when we do the analysis. But the key thing is, is that the vertical box needed to encompass the tubulin lanes on both blots. Okay, uh, you'll also see that the these, these very last uh, lanes here, because they're on the edge of the gel, are somewhat diagonal. This is also okay. When we do the analysis, those lanes will appear slightly broader, as long as we integrate all of the intensity underneath that analyzed uh, uh, blot density. It should be quantitative for the target of interest. Now that we have all of the lanes identified, we're going to analyze. So we'll go to gels, plot lanes, or command three. And here now, what we're seeing is the vertical projection of the band intensity going from 
lane one on the first blot all the way through into the second blot. Note the shift here. This is P38. The, the bottom of the rectangle is the right-hand side of this projection. This is what we're going to ignore right now because we're focused on um, tubulin, and so we're going to focus on this band here. Okay. If we inspect these, our next uh, task is to bound off the curve here describing the tubulin intensity. This can be done a number of different ways. There's not a hard and fast rule about what way is the best. I've also done the side-by-side -side comparisons and shown that it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent with what you do across all of the lanes that are being analyzed, because these are relative changes. For instance, I see in some of these that there's a background value here, some of which are all the way down uh, to zero, but that background could contribute a slight amount to the, um, to the analysis. So what I'm going to decide to do for tubulin here is take the line, straight line tool here. I'm going to hold down the shift button and just box off the tubulin peak as shown here. And then I'm going to repeat that for all of the other lanes. Other instances, one can go crop them off down, um, vertically instead of horizontally. And as I said, it's fine as long as you're consistent. For instance, these ones look like they've already been cropped off by the background, and so I don't need to draw an additional line here. These are fine, this one. off here. The goal is to make sure that there's no white space here because the next thing we're going to do is quantify the, um, the white space. Let me get it straight here. Okay. It's fine. The bulk of the number is going to be in the height of this peak. So these are really sort of small changes here with respect to the numbers. Now that these all look like they've been reasonably boxed off, we'll now use the magic wand tool to select the area that's within this bounding box. And that area within that uh, bounding box is a relative proportion to the abundance of the band if you're in the linear range of the antibody and the target. And so this is the raw densitometry, if you, if you will, for tubulin. So I'll click here. You'll see that the area has been highlighted. And then here's the number for the first time point of the first replicate. Click again, 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 again. With these results, 28 lanes, I simply do Command A, select all, Command C to copy, and then I already have a, a template Excel spreadsheet here. We're going to do tubulin. These are my time points and my replicates. And then I just do Command V to paste in. And then here now are the raw uh, densities for tubulin coinciding with each one of those time points. Don't need this anymore. If we were doing something very critical where we wanted to document uh, all of this, one could save this image. I don't think that it's necessary um, virtually ever. So we'll close that down. Don't need to save that. All right. Um, and we would repeat the exact same thing for the P38 on the bottom here. Um, 
let's do that because I do want to show one a particular example here. So we'll clear these off, reset. All right, so then that gets rid of all of the lanes. Um, maybe out of convenience, I'll use this same box, but I don't necessarily have to. All right, so same thing. Now I'm going to just use all the shortcuts. Command 1 and then Command 2 all the way across. The reason why I want to do P38 is that you'll notice on this lane, there's a spec here. It's an artifact. It's just an autofluorescent little piece of something that got on the membrane. And I'll show you how we deal with that in the densitometry it is a clear artifact. Now that you know what these traces look like, you want to make sure that there's a good amount of real estate above and below the band of interest on the rectangular bounding box because you do want to capture the entire Gaussian-like curve that coincides with each band. So if this got too much closer, it might be harder to figure out where the lane ends. I think here this looks fine. And now we're ready for analysis, so we'll do Command-3. Here are the lanes again. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. I can zoom in with Command-plus to get a little bit better view. Um, to um, crop off the peak of interest. So it looks like here okay so here now is the one that had that little bit of a, a bump there. We know that it's artifact and I can look here and so what I'm going to do with this one, the way that rather than actually manipulate the image, I'm going to try to approximate what I think the trace looks like down to the bottom. Now this becomes our density. So we, we end up removing it in the analysis rather than actually manipulating the image, which could create other undesirable artifacts. Just as before, select them all, copy them all, and then paste them over in the P38 lane as follows. All right, so for the last thing, I'll close this. And I want to show is the uh, EIF4G blot. As I mentioned before, we in fact have two bands of interest. We have the full length EIF4G up on the top, and then this triplet of cleavage products that you can see um, maybe 100 kilodaltons down way up on the, the gel. I want to capture both of these, and I want to capture both of them relative to one another, in that I want this density to, co to be comparable to this density, meaning that I need to do the densitometry on both of them concurrently. This one is a little bit more involved, um, but I'll show you how we can get it done. Set. I can make a new box. Tall enough that it will capture everything on the left and the right hand side. And also, I, sh I should say, narrow enough so that the boxes don't overlap as I run between gels. So, if anything, you're, you're better off erring on the side of a more narrow box to do the analysis rather than analyzing the same pixels on two adjacent lanes. All right, this is a, all this is the same. So command one and then two all the way across.
okay, all of the lanes, and then Command F3 to analyze. I'm going to highlight something um, first uh, when we go through here. Here is the full length EIF 4G peak. As we go with the time, now you can start seeing small remnants of that cleavage product further on down, so to the right, um, on these traces. And it increases over time as we go down here and then we reset. But what I want to emphasize is that note how much area we have for the full length peak relative to the uh, cleavage products. Simply by virtue of the fact that there's a lot of intensity here and less here, there's a lot more area here relative to the area here. And if we want to try to bound this off and do densitometry on it, some of these are going to have really small numbers. For instance, this peak here, how do we box this off in such a way that I mean, there's some background here that we probably want to adjust for. And this is by virtue of the way that the uh, image J by default does the densitometry. It looks at all of the numbers on all of the traces and then seeks to provide a vertical window here that's proportional to the strongest peak. The full length EIF 4G peak is very strong and because it's scaled in this way the cleavage product is very weak. It doesn't have to be this way but when you download image J this is what the default setting is. We'll close this, keep the lanes as follows and then go to gels, gel analyzer options. And the reason how these scalings are set are by the scale factors both horizontal and, and vertical. What we want to do is dramatically expand the vertical scale factor so that we can have a massive peak for full length EIF 4G but get more area to quantify reliably those cleavage products that I highlighted before. To do this we'll increase this scale factor. The number depends upon the blot, but let's say we're going to change this to 20. So now the vertical dimension is going to be 20 times larger than it was before. Click OK. Now with the same lanes, I can go to Analyze, Gels, Replot Lanes. Regrettably, there isn't a Command 4 for this. Now look at the trace. It's enormous. All right, and it's a little bit cumbersome to work with, but now we can really see the full length EIF 4G. We can see that at this first time point here, this is really background um, cleavage. There shouldn't be any cleavage there. So we're not going to try to do any densitometry here because there isn't any real product. As we go further down, so that's the next time point. The next time point, still nothing really there to write home about. But then now as we get to, I guess it's time point four, we can see a very nice triplet, one, two, three, much bigger area. And by my eye and seeing what the background is in these other lanes, I'm going to declare that the way to do the densitometry for this sample is to draw a diagonal line, pretty much like that. And so this illustrates how you don't need to necessarily have a horizontal line across every one. You're assessing the local background, which to me looks like it's sloping downward uh, for this sample. And then I'll seek to maintain that diagonal line for every other band throughout. Similarly, the full length EIF 4G, which is on the left here, seems to have an upward peak than this big shoulder. So what I'll do here is draw a diagonal line from the minimum to the minimum with that shifting background. I need to do that from the beginning. Like that. And again, you can agonize over these things, but it, it matters remarkably little um, if you get the angle just right because the bulk of that area is in the peak. But you do need to um, bound this, otherwise what it will do is calculate all the area underneath here, which we know is background. All right, did that one already. So now you can really nicely see the three peaks in the more intense samples. This I didn't um, 
close here. If I do the wand, it's going to jump out all through here. So I can simply do Command Z to undo. And then like that. All right, I think we have it. Go back to the top, go with the wand. Rather than zigzagging back and forth between the two, what I'll do is do the full length first. And now note that the peaks are gonna be enormous, all right, because I did that vertical dimension. That's fine, it's all relative to this analysis. Okay, Command A, Command C, and then we'll paste the full length first here. All right, and then recall that the first three time points were not detected. And so just cut these and put them in one, two, three. Whether this is ND or zero, it's fine. I'll leave it blank for now. And there you have it. I'll be repeating the same for this other channel, all of the exact same procedures. Drawing the box, selecting each one of the lanes, doing the analysis, and making sure that I pick the right vertical dimension on the analysis display so that I can capture smaller peaks of amino reactivity that otherwise might be um, not shown on the default display. In fact, I know that I'll have to do that for this uh, blot because if I blow this up very intensely, I'm keenly interested in some of these very faint bands here as well as the more intense ones. So I'll be doing the exact same procedure like I just did for EIF4G. Hope you found the tutorial informative and Happy analysis of your Western blots.